In an early direct line, we talked about the dilemma faced by most human beings in our kind of society, which is the matter of making decisions. We've learned that ours is the only species on Earth whose natural state is one of disorientation, and therefore each of us must create his own world, even if the creation of our world consists in nothing more than playing copycat, closing our eyes and ears and just blindly following the person in front of us, hoping that somehow he or the person he's following knows where he's going and that when we get there, we'll both like it. We like to think that we're intelligent and perhaps even bold decision-makers, but the facts seem to indicate that we're not and that we use all kinds of dodges to keep from making decisions. In reading a back issue of Psychology Today, April 1973, I learned of a book which I immediately ordered, written by Princeton philosopher Walter Kaufman, entitled With Guilt and Justice, From Decidophobia to Autonomy. Now, in this book, with a long title, obviously the result of many years of thoughtful study and research and a lot of independent thinking, Kaufman lists and explains ten major cop-outs most of us use to keep from making decisions, and which makes us decidophobes. Decidophobia is simply the fear of making decisions. He lists as the most common form of this malady, which robs us of our freedom and opportunity, plain everyday drifting. We go through the motions day after day. We get up, get dressed, go to work, on the job and off. We simply let the tide take us as it has in the past. Kaufman calls that type A drifting. Type B drifting is a fooler. It's the kind of drifting people do who pretend they don't belong to type A. He, the uh, type B drifter, tries to give the impression that he is in revolt against the so-called status quo that he sees about him on every side, and he drops out of life. He lives from moment to moment, day to day, letting chance decide the direction of his life. Now, this is simply another form of drifting, another cop-out, another way of avoiding the agony of making meaningful, faithful decisions. This type conforms as rigidly to his group of failures, in his dress or lack of it, his hair, his walk, his talk, his attitudes, as the type A drifter conforms to his. The whole thing is a studied and thus tense acting job, all for the sake of avoiding decisions and taking charge of one's own life. He goes on to point out that religion has for centuries been mankind's number one strategy for avoiding decisions. We don't even have to decide which of the many religions and sects to choose. Our parents usually make the choice for us, just as their parents made the choice for them. We are confirmed in that faith at an early age, long before we have anything even approaching the powers of intelligent choice, and we simply grow up in it. Now we have all the shall-nots and shalls we need, and every week we have an official of our faith to tell us what we should be doing and how we should be living our lives. Now this is not always the case, of course. Many people have chosen their own religions for important reasons and have found meaning and satisfaction in doing so. But the great multitude simply moves up another notch on the generation bracket, just as it does with its political party and other prejudices. After religion comes the type A and type B drifters that I mentioned. Incidentally, it seems that in order to be a drifter, many people require a regular supply of alcohol, drugs, or tranquilizers to keep their minds below the threshold of the window through which they might get a clear view of themselves and their meaningless lives. Kaufman refers to these people as being inauthentic. And it seems that when just plain drifting brings about a feeling of hopelessness, this type will join a movement of some kind. When a person lacks identity within himself, he will often strive to find it in an organization of some sort which will take over the decision-making role. But do as I've done. Order the book and read it. It'll give you a much clearer insight into your decisions of the past, and you'll recall that it's by examining our decisions that we can come to know ourselves. What we're seeking, as Professor Kaufman of Princeton points out, is autonomy, authenticity as sovereign persons. An autonomous person avoids all ten strategies. He does not treat his own conclusions and decisions as authoritative or necessarily best, but chooses with his eyes open and then keeps them open, Kaufman says. He has the courage to admit that he may be wrong even about matters of the greatest importance. He objects to the ten strategies in the book, not on account of their supposed psychological origins, but because they preclude uninhibited self-criticism. Now, there are some well-known people who've resisted all ten strategies and lived autonomous lives. The most outstanding examples from the long history of Western philosophy are Socrates and Nietzsche. And Kaufman cites as a perfect modern example of the completely autonomous person, one who exhibits the most awesome courage, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Rarely has it been so difficult for any man to stand alone, utterly alone, without any prop of any kind. His great books, The First Circle, Cancer Ward, Solzhenitsyn, a documentary record in August 1914, 
show how he succeeded in resisting all ten temptations, making one fateful decision after another against seemingly insuperable odds. His life is autonomy in action. I have read Solzhenitsyn's books, and I consider them to be among the most important in my library, and I recommend them to you. How does one go about making decisions on his own, decisions calculated to bring him face to face with the best possible life for him? He goes by his gut feelings. He listens to the voice within, and he knows Thoreau was right when he said, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. It's the decision to live my life, not necessarily the lives of those I see about me. In Man and People, Ortega says that each one of us is always in danger of not being the unique and untransferable self which he is. The majority of men, he wrote, perpetually betray this self which is waiting to be. And to tell the whole truth, our personal individuality is a personage which is never completely realized, a stimulating utopia, a secret legend which each of us guards in the depths of his heart. It is thoroughly comprehensible that Pindar summarizes his heroic ethics in the well-known imperative, Become what you are. Become what you are. That perhaps sums it up best, and this kind of thinking runs counter to the kindergarten philosophy of most people that the purpose of life is to be happy. Happiness is to life what a paint job is to a product. It's the glistening veneer and nothing more. What counts is the product itself, its quality, the depth, the truth of its design and purpose. My good friend Norman Gass of the Dartnell Company reminded me of a quotation from Alex Munth's novel, The Story of San Michel. It was published back in 1929 and was the book that started the vogue and success of the many doctor books, movies, soap operas, and television programs since. But in it, there appears this line. A man can stand a lot as long as he can stand himself. He can live without hope, without books, without friends, without music, as long as he can listen to his own thoughts. As long as he can listen to his own thoughts. And it's on those thoughts that we should act. There is often pain in that, the birth pains of new birth, and perhaps an occasional sensation of falling, of being unsupported. It means not sitting and wallowing in our old beliefs, but moving out of them into new, fresh territory. It means asking the question, am I living by my standards or by the standards of those about me? And are they living by their own standards or the standards of those about them? It's possible that we've all been wrong. Soren Kierkegaard wrote, The greatest danger, that of losing one's own self, may pass off quietly as if it were nothing. Every other loss, that of an arm, a leg, five dollars, and so forth, is sure to be noticed. That was written more than a hundred years ago. The whole idea is to become a winner as opposed to becoming a loser. But just who is a winner, and what do we mean by losing? There's a marvelous little paperback titled Born to Win by James and Youngward, or Jungward, former students of Dr. Eric Byrne of transactional analysis fame. You probably read his book, Games People Play. But they've got a very good definition of what we mean by winners and losers. They point out that each human being is born as something new, something that never existed before. He's born with what he needs to win at life. Each person, in his own way, can see, hear, touch, taste, and think for himself. Each has his own unique potentials, his capabilities and limitations. Each can be a significant, thinking, aware, and creatively productive person in his own right, a winner. When we refer to a person as a winner, we do not mean one who beats the other guy by winning over him and making him lose. To us, a winner is one who responds authentically by being credible, trustworthy, responsive, and genuine, both as an individual and as a member of society, they write. A loser is one who fails to respond authentically. Few people are 100% winners or 100% losers. It's a matter of degree. However, once a person is on the road to being a winner, his chances are greater for becoming even more so. Winners have different potentials. Achievement is not the most important thing. Authenticity is. The authentic person experiences the reality of himself by knowing himself, being himself, and becoming a credible, responsive person. He actualizes his own unprecedented uniqueness and appreciates the uniqueness of others. They go on to write, He does not dedicate his life to a concept of what he imagines he should be. Rather, he is himself, 
and as such he does not use his energy putting on a performance, maintaining pretense, and manipulating others into his games. A winner can reveal himself instead of projecting images that please, provoke, or entice others. He's aware that there's a difference between being loving and acting loving, between being stupid and acting stupid, between being knowledgeable and acting knowledgeable. He does not need to hide behind a mask. He throws off unrealistic self-images of inferiority or superiority. Autonomy does not frighten a winner. Autonomy does not frighten a winner. It does not frighten a Solzhenitsyn, a Socrates. The ridiculous Watergate affair which exposed to Americans and the world the venal inner workings of politics would never have happened in the first place if a few insiders had had the guts to stand up and act like winners. In the book Born to Win, it's pointed out that everyone has moments of autonomy, if only fleeting. However, a winner is able to sustain his autonomy over ever-increasing periods of time. He may lose ground occasionally. He may even fail. Yet in spite of setbacks, a winner maintains a basic faith in himself. A winner is not afraid to do his own thinking and to use his own knowledge. He can separate facts from opinion and doesn't pretend to have all the answers. He listens to others, evaluates what they say, but comes to his own conclusions. And while he can admire and respect other people, he's not totally defined, demolished, bound, or awed by them. A winner does not play helpless, nor does he play the blaming game. Instead, he assumes responsibility for his own life. He does not give others a false authority over him. He's his own boss and knows it. A winner's timing is right. He responds appropriately to the situation. His response is appropriate when it is related to the message sent and preserves the significance, worth, well-being, and dignity of the people involved. He knows that for everything there is a season, and for every activity a time. A time to be aggressive, and a time to be passive. A time to be together, and a time to be alone. A time to fight, and a time to love. A time to work, and a time to play. A time to cry, and a time to laugh a time to confront, and a time to withdraw, a time to speak, and a time to be silent, a time to hurry, and a time to wait. In describing losers, James and John would write, although people are born to win, they're also born helpless and totally dependent on their environment. Winners successfully make the transition from total helplessness to independence, and then to interdependence. Losers do not. Somewhere along the line, they begin to avoid becoming self-responsible. Their winning or losing is influenced by what happens to them in childhood. A lack of response to dependency needs, poor nutrition, brutality, unhappy relationships, disease, continuing disappointment, inadequate physical care, and traumatic events are among the many experiences that contribute to making people losers. Such experiences interrupt, deter, or prevent the normal progress toward autonomy and self-actualization. To cope with negative experiences, a child learns to manipulate himself and others. And these manipulative techniques are hard to give up later in life and often become set patterns. A winner works to shed them. A loser hangs on to them. Some losers speak of themselves as successful but anxious, successful but trapped, or successful but unhappy. Others speak of themselves as totally beaten, without purpose, unable to move, half dead or bored to death. A loser may not recognize that, for the most part, he's been building his own cage and digging his own grave and is a bore to himself. A loser seldom lives in the present. He destroys the present by occupying his mind with past memories or future expectations. When the loser lives in the past, he dwells on the good old days or his past misfortunes. Nostalgically, he either clings to the way things used to be or bemoans his bad luck. He feels sorry for himself and shifts the responsibility for his unsatisfactory life onto others. Blaming others and excusing himself are often part of his games. A loser who lives in the past may lament, If only, if only I had married someone else, if only I had a different job, if only I would finished school, if only I had been handsome or beautiful, if only my spouse had stopped drinking, if only I had been born rich, if only I would had better parents. They go on to describe other characteristics of the loser, such as trying to live in the future or worrying about future catastrophes. 
It's a book worth getting and adding to your library. I think every member of your family will enjoy reading it. It helps determine whether we're among the winners or losers, and more importantly, what to do if we find ourselves in the wrong camp. The key word in our thinking and our conduct, in our goals and in our lives, is authenticity. We need to become what we are. I imagine the teachers get sick to death of hearing people tell them how to educate their charges. Everybody on earth seems to be a self-styled expert on just about everything under the sun, including that most difficult and certainly most important calling, teaching. I'm one of them, and I confess that I don't know anything about teaching. But we're looking for answers, and that's the important thing. Socrates said that the important thing is to learn how best to live our lives. I'll buy that. But how does one teach others how they can best live their lives? He can't. It's none of his affair. But more than that, he cannot tell another person how best to live his life any more than anyone can tell him how best to live his. But some things can be taught. They can be taught so that the person at the other end becomes so emotionally involved, so moved by what he's learning, that he realizes that what he has learned can be applied to his own life in the pursuit of the goals that are important to him. Now, trying to tell someone else how to live his life is like telling children that they must add the numbers 10 and 9 and keep adding just those two numbers so that they can keep getting the number 19 as a result. It's ridiculous. Instead, we teach them how to add so that they can then add any numbers that are important to what they happen to be doing. We teach them to read so that they can read anything they desire to read. But we often don't do the best job of telling them why it's so important that they become skilled in these exercises, why it's so important to a good life, a successful life. If we teach principles and explain why it is important that we understand those principles, what understanding them can mean in our lives and the lives of those dear to us, we teach at the same time a love of learning that will remain with a person all the years of his life. If we teach a person how to successfully sell a hammer, he can successfully sell anything. It's the principles of selling he learns. The product or service can be whatever he wants it to be. And his drive, the intensity he brings to his work, will be regulated by his goals, sometimes strong, sometimes weak, depending on what's going on in his life, and on whether or not he understands that he can reach the goals he establishes for himself and those he loves. Poor motivation almost always results from confusion as to what a person wants and or self-doubt as to his capacity to really accomplish his dreams. It's difficult for a child raised in a ghetto who has spent 15 years or more living with failure on every side of him to really believe that he can have anything he can qualify for. It's hard for him to understand that even though his father and mother and aunts and uncles and neighbors have all failed, he can succeed. He can have what he wants in life. But if he learns the principles that are involved and understands that if they'll work for little things, they'll also work for big things, it can revolutionize his life. I found the answer to a problem that's been plaguing me for years. During the past century, knowledge has multiplied a thousand times faster than during all the preceding ages of man. And knowing that to be a fact, I couldn't figure out why people didn't seem to get any smarter. Why the 20th century, with all its wonderful breakthroughs in all fields of human knowledge, has been one of the most barbaric in man's history. Well, in his excellent book, Some Lessons in Metaphysics, Jose Ortega y Gasset reminds us that man by himself would never be a student, just as man by himself would never be a taxpayer. He must pay taxes. He has to study. But he is, by nature, neither a taxpayer nor a student. To be a student or a taxpayer is an artificial state in which man finds himself by obligation, so people will learn no more than they absolutely must which isn't much. Now, meanwhile, generation after generation, the frightening mass of human knowledge which the student must assimilate piles up, and in proportion, as knowledge grows, is enriched and becomes specialized, the student will move farther and farther away from feeling any immediate and genuine need for it. Each time there will be less congruence between the sad human activity which is studying and the admirable human occupation which is true knowing. And so the terrible gap which began at least a century ago, continues to grow, the gap between living culture, genuine knowledge, and the ordinary man. Culture, or knowledge, has no other reality than to respond to needs that are truly felt and to satisfy them in one way or another. But the way of transmitting knowledge is to study, which is not to feel those needs. 
Therefore, culture or knowledge hangs in midair and has no roots of sincerity in the average man. Now, this culture, which does not have any root structure in man, a culture which does not spring from him spontaneously, lacks any native and indigenous values. Now, this is something imposed. It's extrinsic, strange, foreign, and unintelligible. In short, it's unreal. Underneath this culture, received but not truly assimilated, man will remain intact as he was. That is to say, he will remain uncultured, a barbarian. Now, when the process of knowing was shorter, more elemental, and more organic, it came closer to being felt by the common man who then assimilated it, recreated it, and revitalized it within himself. This explains the colossal paradox of these decades, that an enormous progress in terms of culture should have produced a man of the type we now have, a man indisputably more barbarous than was the man of a hundred years ago, and that this acculturation, this accumulation of culture, should produce, paradoxically but automatically, humanity's return to barbarism. To say the problem might be solved by not studying at all would not be to solve the problem, but to ignore it. If a whole generation should cease to study, nine-tenths of the human race then alive would die a violent death. To solve the problem will take a deep reform of study and the student. In order to achieve this, one must turn teaching completely around. Primarily and fundamentally, teaching must be the teaching of a need for the science and not the teaching of the science itself, whose need the student doesn't feel. But that's why we don't get smarter. I have an interesting uh, question for you here. What is life? This might be a question you'd like to bring up at the dinner table with the kids. What is life? Do you have a pretty good answer? There is a good one, and it was given to us by the same Jose Ortega y Gasset. It appears in his book, Some Lessons in Metaphysics, which we recommend. That's a book I think every thinking person should read 10 or 15 times, and I know you'll enjoy it. He wrote, What then is life? Do not search far afield. Do not try to recall learned expressions of wisdom. The fundamental truths must be always at hand, for only thus are they fundamental. Those that one must go forth to seek are the ones that are found only in a single place, the particular localized provincial truths, the truths in a corner, not the basic ones. Life is what we are and what we do. It is then, of all things, the closest to each one of us. Put a hand on it, and it will let itself be grasped like a tame bird. You can read for twenty years and not come up with something as true and basic and marvelous as that. Life is what we are and what we do. Life is what we do and what happens to us. Life is always a now, and it consists of what now is. The past and the future of your life have reality only in the now, and this is thanks to the fact that you now remember your past or anticipate your future. And in this sense, life is pure actuality. It is punctual, a point in the present, which contains all our past and all our future. And then Gasset would say to his students at the University of Madrid, The purpose of these lessons is no other than to incite each of you to take care of your life, for you have only one, and that one is composed of a given number, a very limited number, of instants, of nows. To use that number badly is to destroy it to kill a bit of your life. Nothing of what we do would be our life if we did not take account of it. Living is that strange, unique reality which has the privilege of existing for its own sake. All living is one's own living, feeling oneself live, knowing oneself to be existing, where knowing does not imply intellectual knowledge or any special wisdom, but is that surprising presence which one's life has for every one of us. Without that knowing, without that awareness, an aching tooth would not hurt us. The stone does not feel itself, nor does it know itself to be a stone. Toward itself, as toward everything else, it is totally blind. Living, on the other hand, is a revelation, a refusal to content oneself with being unless one sees or understands what one is, a become acquainted with oneself. It is the incessant discovery that we make of ourselves and of the world around us. In its very root and heart, living consists in knowing and understanding ourselves, in noticing ourselves and what surrounds us, in being transparent to ourselves. Life is what we do. 
Life is what we do because life is knowing what we are doing. It is, in short, finding ourselves in the world and occupied with the things and the beings of the world. And here's another question you might want to pop on your family at dinner or a friend at lunch. In the billions of years since the Earth's formation, what was the most important thing that ever happened on Earth? I got to thinking about this at lunch the other day, and I think it makes for an interesting topic. What's the most important thing that ever happened on the planet Earth? Do you know? Well, if you think about it for a few minutes, you realize that it was the appearance of man. If it hadn't been for him, no one would ever have known the Earth existed. But we still don't know if the appearance of man was good or bad. Good or bad, that is, from the standpoint of the billions of other creatures on the planet. About 9,000 years ago, man began his first rudimentary civilization with the planting of crops and the domestication of animals. And in all the centuries since that time, he's been growing progressively worse as far as being a neighbor is concerned. Worse to all other living things, including himself. In the Pogo comic strip, one of the characters said, We have met the enemy, and he is us. But it wasn't until the 20th century that man really showed what he was capable of. With the Industrial Revolution and burgeoning technology, man was able to outdo even himself, with the result that ours has been the bloodiest century in the history of man. Following the communist takeovers in Russia and China and the other countries they've managed to corral into their imperialistic sphere, millions upon millions of men, women, and children have been killed. It's been estimated that six million were killed in Russia alone. No one knows how many were slaughtered in China. This was after the Japanese did a pretty good job there themselves. Then came World War II. I'm not mentioning World War I. We were still learning then. In addition to the millions who died as combatants, many more millions of innocent civilians were slaughtered under Hitler in Nazi Germany, perhaps eight million, maybe more. Since the dawn of this century, and it came in so softly, so quietly, there has been more pure, unadulterated mayhem and slaughter than in any former ten centuries put together capped with our own invention of the atomic bomb, which was designed, built, and dropped for the specific purpose of wiping out entire cities the way you wipe out an anthill. Overkill. Men, women, little children, the sick and the pregnant, the blind, the helpless. Kill them all. The ultimate weapon was finally invented, and the means to deliver it to any spot on the face of the earth in minutes. Of course, it's undergone a whole lot of improvements since 1945. We've got thermonuclear devices now that can wipe out an entire country. In fact, we're approaching the point now where we have more missiles than targets. One missile, the MIRV, can incinerate in an instant millions of civilians in a whole collection of towns and cities, and the century still has a few years to go. I wonder what the 21st century will be like. Because all we've proved in 9,000 years is that we keep getting more efficient at killing each other. You might pop that question to your family or your friends at lunch. What was the most important thing that ever happened on the face of the earth? Well, it was the appearance of man. Next question, was it good or bad? From the evidence so far, there's really only one answer to that. In an excellent article for Red Book magazine some time back, a Dr. Sidney M. Girard, professor of psychology at the University of Florida, and the well-known artist Whitman collaborated on an article entitled The Fear That Cheats Us of Love. Now, they point out that if we want to be loved, we must disclose ourselves. We must disclose ourselves to the other person. If we want to love someone, he must permit us to know him. Now, this would seem obvious, yet most of us spend a great part of our lives hiding our true selves and our true feelings from the other person. Now, why is this so? Well, for a great variety of reasons, some obvious, some not, some sensible, some profoundly harmful. But the most important reason springs from the very nature of the human enterprise itself. Paradoxically, we fail to disclose ourselves to other people because we want so much to be loved. By failing to disclose ourselves, we make that love difficult, if not impossible. Children don't know their parents. Parents don't know their children. Husbands and wives are often strangers to each other. One has only to think of the astronomical rate of divorce and of the contemporary conflict between parent and children. One has only to hear the anxiety and pain expressed in the therapist's office when these closest of all relationships are touched upon, to know that it's possible to be involved in a family for years, playing one's role nicely and never getting to know the other members of the family who are also playing roles. 
It seems that much of human life is best described as impersonation. We are role players, every one of us. We say that we feel things we don't feel. We say that we did things we did not do. We say that we believe things that we do not believe. We pretend that we're loving when we're full of hostility. We pretend that we're calm and indifferent when we actually are trembling with anxiety and fear. We not only conceal ourselves, we also usually assume that the other person is in hiding. We're wary of him because we take it for granted that he too will frequently misrepresent his real feelings, his intentions, or his past, since we so often are guilty of doing these very things ourselves. Another reason we hide is to protect ourselves from change. Change is frightening to most people. A young bride returns from her honeymoon still lost in the romantic haze of being in love, blissfully happy and convinced that that's the way it's always going to be. One day her husband comes home, troubled over some problem at work, and broods in silence or snaps at her irritably. She in turn finds that getting meals and cleaning house, even when they're done for her husband, aren't all that satisfying. Her feelings are changing. But instead of facing the fact that nothing in life stands still, she tries to pretend to herself and to her husband that she feels exactly as she did before. We try to remain constant, to freeze time, and time won't be frozen. And we don't want the other person to change either. The answer? Relax and level with each other. Without self-disclosure, real, long-range love is impossible. By opening ourselves up, we find the other person will do the same, and love has a chance. Self-disclosure is as important a part of growing as it is of love, and growth is a part of change. The real self is continually evolving. One's needs, wishes, feelings, values, goals, and behavior all change with age and experience. The answer, disclose ourselves to those we love.